Hello and welcome to How to Be Productive Even When Your Health is Working Against You. I'm Christina Adams and I really hope that you find this useful. Um, since this is only a short presentation, we won't be able to cover everything, but hopefully some of the advice in here will inspire you to try different things with your own health problems that may not be listed. So, let's get started started. <clears throat> now Robert Louis Stevenson um, is most well known for writing Treasure Island and Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde but he was actually very very sick as a child. He actually uh, was in and out of hospital a lot. They don't really know what was wrong with him but um, he travelled around a lot and therefore he wrote a lot of travel memoirs, he wrote a lot of poetry. In fact he wrote and published over 59 pieces in 12 years before he died and he did actually die very young he died at 44 and some people think that the reason he was so prolific was because of what was wrong with him which sounds weird but knowing that you know you could die tomorrow there's a certain sense of taking away the unnecessary in a life that comes along with it it really helps you to see what's important and it's worth remembering that our health problems don't have to stop us they can actually help us in some ways but they can also hold us back they don't have to but which camp you fall into very much falls to you um, another great example is Helen Keller she was deaf blind but she was still an author activist and lecturer in fact, she um, was the first deafblind person to get a BA. So let's take a look at the short term health problems that can hold you back. The cold and flu, it's getting towards that kind of season as I record this and offices are undoubtedly going to be full of people coughing and sneezing and what have you. Viruses, uh, stuff like chest infections, throat infections, etc. Eye strain can come a lot when you're staring at a computer screen, writing, or for your day job. Headaches go hand in hand with eye strain. Periods, um, when it's that time of the month, some people manage fine, some people struggle a little bit, some people are in excruciating pain and cannot function because it is so painful. Broken or fractured bones. And vitamin and mineral deficiencies, this is something we don't often think about, but they can actually imitate the symptoms of much more serious conditions. Long-term and chronic health conditions, let's take a look at those. So these are um, anything that's going on for three months or more. So asthma, your weight, either being underweight or overweight, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease where you can't digest gluten, diabetes types 1 and 2 and food allergies intolerances and sensitivities um, these can come on at any time in life you're not necessarily born with them so you may find that you can digest food perfectly fine one year and then the next year your body starts to struggle with it well so we've got we've got repetitive strain industry injury again that comes from working with computers a lot back pain, another one when you're sitting at a desk, migraines, endometriosis, where which is related to very, very painful periods, as is polycystic ovary syndrome, menopause, another thing we don't talk about enough, arthritis, which is um, pain in your joints and is often in a specific area. You can tell um, it, it's arthritis because it's often red and swollen compared to its sister disease, fibromyalgia, where it is not red and swollen and the person with it may look completely fine but in actual fact could be in excruciating pain. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome is another one, these two are related, um, they have very similar symptoms such as the constant pain with no cause and being tired all the time. There are minute differences and also differences in cause but there is no cure for them so it's very much about finding ways to manage the disease and as some of you may know I do have fibro and CFS sometimes known as ME particularly if you're in the states 
but it is possible to live with it. There are some people who struggle with it much more than I do, and I have some days where I am in a very bad way, but it is manageable. So what are the solutions? Um, for a cold and flu, the obvious one, get your flu jab. Um, I'm a big advocate for that. I have a massive fear of needles, but I'd rather have a needle than the flu. Go for an eye test and maybe look into getting stronger glasses if you're getting eye strain a lot. Take your vitamins, particularly again at this time of year as it's starting to get um, darker and darker. You may not be getting as much vitamin D. Um, vitamin D can cause depression, it can cause joint pain, um, lack of iron can cause lethargy. So it's definitely worth looking into your vitamin and mineral intake. Obviously, if you're perfectly healthy, you're getting your five a day, etc. It's not going to make a difference. But let's face it, most of us don't. And if we're in the UK, we're certainly not getting enough vitamin D anytime soon. Changing your diet can make a massive difference, particularly if you think you might be intolerant or sensitive to something. Um, I changed my diet a few years ago to cut out dairy. That wasn't particularly fun. Um, I did miss it for a long time, but... It was a necessary evil and it has made a big difference to me because dairy does exacerbate my joint pain so without it I am much more productive. A hot bath or a shower is really good if your uh, joints are painful. It can just help them to relax, it can help your mind to relax as well which really helps. And a good old massage, don't underestimate a good old massage and if you don't like the idea of like an actual person doing it you can get those machines that will do it. Like you can get them for 30 or 40 quid on Amazon. And um, I bought one, not thinking it would be that good, but I'll, you know, I'll give it a go for 30 quid. And actually it's really good. Um, it's soothing and it got a lot of the knots out of my neck and you can kind of change how much pressure it puts on your neck based on how hard you pull on it. So that's really good. Other things you can do, yoga is really good for your joints if they're bad, it's also good for your breathing, so if you're asthmatic. Um, other forms of exercise can help, like Pilates, um, I found badminton was quite good for my shoulders. Um, if you're new to exercise, take it easy, don't throw yourself in at the deep end because you will struggle. Start, you know, with a few stretches, don't just expect to be able to do like a whole kickboxing or um, Zumba class from the get-go especially if you have issues with your joints or your breathing or whatever you will struggle to start with but if you build yourself up it will get easier over time in terms of how you work a standing desk or a more comfortable chair can make a massive difference um i have a standing desk at home and it really helps my back um when i changed jobs as well my back pain pretty much disappeared and one of the reasons was because i had a better chair lighting we often underestimate the effect that the lighting in our room can have on us, but I find um, really bright white light gives me a headache. Whereas if I have a kind of yellow light, it's much easier on my eyes. Although there is a running joke that I'm part vampire because I do quite like working in the dark. If you're sensitive to noise, noise cancelling headphones are great. Um, noise is actually a trigger for my joint pain. So I do carry some noise cancelling earphones around with me. They're not like, the world's best or the world's most expensive but they do what they need to do and they really really help me temperature this is another one we don't think about but the temperature of the room that we're working in can really affect how productive we are um if it's too hot or too cold for us it can cause our joints to seize up it can cause us to start daydreaming it can cause us to start sweating so do take a think about that and particularly if you work in an office that can affect your body temperature quite a lot because it's designed for the average man back in the 1960s you know so for a lot of us actually it's not a great temperature to go with and of course technology now i'm talking things like use um a tablet to take notes rather than writing by hand to help your wrist or you could dictate stuff um a lot of writers start dictating now when they're doing their first draft rather than writing it down because it um it's less work for their hands obviously um it means you can dictate your novel while you're out walking the dog you know maybe not if you're a romance writer that could be a bit awkward but there are lots of ways that technology can really help you um both in your writing life in your personal life and in your work life sleep hygiene if you go to the doctor and say you can't sleep then i guarantee you this is what they will suggest it's 
basically where you have a routine for sleep, it's that simple. So you turn off your phone at X time, you have a hot shower at X time, you read a book for X amount of minutes, etc. Blood tests. If you're tired or in pain all the time, it is not normal. Please don't ever think that it is and please don't ever accept people telling you that you're fine if you don't feel that you are. It took me five or six blood tests to get my diagnosis and um, even after that I was referred to a specialist before I started to get answers. But blood tests are worth it, so do push to get them done. Medication. Um, I am on medication for my fibro. There are people on much stronger medication than me, but take what you need to take. Don't see it as a panacea and don't rely on it, but it can very much make a big difference if you give it a chance to. The most important one though is to not be afraid to rest. Um, resting is really important and a lot of us seem to be afraid of it, but the thing is the longer you delay resting, the longer you'll eventually have to rest for to recover. So if you rest now while you're teetering on the edge, you'll be able to pull yourself back before you fall off and you can't function. But if you fall off and you can't function, it's going to take a lot longer for you to find that rope and claw your way back up, okay? So remember that. What about our mental and emotional health? We've got stress. People forget stress is actually a mental illness if it's been going on for a prolonged period of time and it can cause a lot of um, physical and mental health problems. It can cause joint pain. Some people think it can even trigger fibro. It can trigger depression, anxiety, even bipolar disorder. Grief. Grief um, can be incredibly painful. Again, it can trigger a lot of mental health issues and it should very much not be underestimated. Anger. If we don't deal with our anger, it can cause issues in our personal lives, in our work lives. It can very much hold us back. Depression. One of the biggest mental health conditions in the world. And anxiety. The biggest mental health condition in the world. And paired with with depression, sorry, it is the most popular combination. Anxiety encompasses everything from generalised anxiety disorder, where you have a constant feeling of dread, um, panic disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, and panic attacks. And panic attacks should never be underestimated, okay? Because a panic attack can be as painful, sometimes even more painful, than a heart attack. We've also got post-traumatic stress disorder postnatal depression, sometimes called postpartum depression, addiction, which can come in many forms. We've also got eating disorders, stuff like bulimia, anorexia, and um, overeating, and bipolar disorder. Like I said, this is not an exhaustive list, okay? But hopefully some of the advice in the following slides will help, whether your condition is listed or not. So, what have we got? Reading, baking, crafts, or other active pastimes. Obviously, writing may be included in that for you um, if it's not part of your day job or your career. Um, but the point is to do something active. So, don't watch TV or watch a film because that is passive and it won't take your mind off things. What you want is something that uses your hands and your eyes and as many parts of your body as possible, basically, to take your mind off things. Time with pets. Um, on this slide to the left is a picture of our puppy Millie. If you hear any weird noises during this presentation, I apologise. She's currently attacking her bed. Um, but spending time with pets can be really therapeutic and can make a massive difference to how you feel. Socialising. Um, the more we socialise, the happier we are. And certain mental health conditions can be very isolating. But it's important to remember that those you love are there for you and you should take advantage of that. Me time. Maybe your me time comes in the form of reading or writing or the other active pastimes mentioned. Maybe it's mindfulness or meditation. Um, it's up to you, but the important thing is that you're doing something solely for you. I never used to be on the meditation bandwagon personally, but when I was quite stressed out a few months ago, I decided it was time to really give it a proper go. And I... I do find that it makes a difference and I feel a lot calmer and um, if you've seen a documentary on Netflix called The Mind Explained it will show you this picture of a guy and he um, set himself on fire and meditated through the entire thing and he didn't feel anything and 
that's probably one of the most insane things I've ever said, but it is true, and you can look that photo up if you want to. What else have we got? Planning. Um, I'm a big fan of planning. I plan all my books out quite far ahead of writing them because it clears my mind of ideas so that then I can focus on what's directly in front of me. Um, I also like to plan what I'm going to do ahead of time. If, say, I've got something big coming up one day, I will make sure that I've got space either side to rest so that I'm not doing too much and overexerting myself because one of the symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome is feeling tired after you've done a particular activity like, you know, doing a public speaking gig or whatever. So making sure that you rest either side of that is really, really important. And you can do that much better if you plan. Time management, what I've just said, ties in with that. Also knowing how to utilise the time that you have, whether it's a lot or a little. So say you've got an hour and you're feeling tired, you're much better off resting for half an hour and writing for half an hour because then you've got more energy to write and what you write will be of a higher quality rather than if you start writing when you're feeling really tired. Your quality of work will just go down and down as you're working. Prioritisation. It's a sad fact of life that we'll never achieve everything we want to in life and therefore we should prioritise what's really important. When I decided to publish my books, a lot of my other hobbies um, fell by the wayside and that was a conscious decision on my part because I knew that the more time I spent writing, the faster I could publish my book. So you really need to sit down and think about what's important to you and what you want to achieve. Single tasking. Um, multitasking is often seen as like the thing to do, but actually it's counterproductive because the more you try and split your focus, the harder it is to really go deep on what you're trying to do and you end up making more mistakes and your work is therefore of a lesser quality. But if you really go deep on something, you can finish it faster, you make fewer mistakes and it's of a much higher quality. Um, two in five of us suffer from a mental health condition triggered by our job. So if you do find that's the case, look at changing what you do. I know that's easier said than done in a lot of cases, but it is a candidate's market out there. Businesses are struggling to find the right people for roles. So look at getting your CV updated, you know, and talk to agencies, tell them what you're looking for. Take advantage of places like LinkedIn. There is a solution if you think your job is triggering you. And finally, we've got self-awareness. So building self-awareness is quite difficult. It's one of those things that kind of comes from life more than anything else. But once you start to build that self-awareness, it becomes a journey that carries you through life, basically. And it's such an important skill that people really do take for granted. We've also got talking therapy, which is exactly what it sounds like. We've got cognitive behavioural therapy, where um, you deal with one of your issues. Um, it usually follows a particular theme over a course of a few sessions and is used for stuff like dealing with fibromyalgia or anxiety. Letting go of what you can't control. This is the difficult one. I think a lot of us have a habit of offering other people advice and wanting to help everyone we see, but the truth is that you just can't. You can't help everyone and even people who come to you for advice probably won't take it, so why spend that energy essentially? Why not use that energy instead on your own issues and fixing your own problems? Because then you're going to have a whole lot more energy to look inside. And the hardest thing of all is to admit and accept that you have a problem. But you can't do any of the other steps really until you do admit and accept that you have a problem. And you can't do this until you admit that you have a problem either. So asking for help is really important. Um, you can ask your family. You can ask your friends and if it, neither of them want to help you then I'm not sure why they're in your life in the first place because they probably don't care as much as they make out. I'm sorry but that's how it is. I have some friends who've cut out family members from their lives and they're some of the happiest people I know. Colleagues, your colleagues are there to help you as is your boss and your HR department at work if you're self-employed then there are lots of networking communities out there that can help you um never underestimate communities like that they can and do make a massive difference 
your doctor or nurse um, can be a big help as well. But it's worth remembering they have a lot of patients and your health isn't their priority. You have to prioritise your health for other people to prioritise it too. And that's why I say if they say that you know your first tests have come back fine and you still don't feel right, you should push to get more tests done. And finally, a counsellor. One of my friends actually thinks that everyone should have a counsellor and I do think she is onto something. Unfortunately, that's simply too expensive to do. But having someone to talk to about your issues can make a massive difference. And that's um, what this slide really boils down to. It makes a massive difference to have even just one person that knows and understands what you're going through and is willing to listen. They don't have to have the answers, they just have to be on your side. So, I really hope that you found this useful. If you have, do check out my book, Productivity for Writers. It's got everything that we've discussed and much, much more. The link is in the description below, so do grab your copy and if you love it, leave a review. Thanks in advance.